ESPN 94.1 FM at AM 930 present The Drive. Brought to you by Huntington Federal Savings Bank. Local then, local now. Never FDIC. It is Monday, April 27th. Your drive begins now on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. I'm your host, Paul Swan. You can join the program anytime by calling the Miller Lite phone line. That's right, 877-420-TALK, 877-420-8255. Miller Lite, whole true, great taste only, and I mean this only, 96 calories it is, the original light beer. So how'd your weekend go? Mine consisted of the NFL draft, and that was Saturday. Sunday, Jordan, the last dance. That was it. That was my sports weekend. Everything else pretty much is a blur, but I can remember those two events vividly, and more so Thursday and Friday and then Saturday for me for the draft. Of course, the Bengals got their business out of the way, and they got Joe Burrow. We talked about that last week, and I think they did overall a pretty good job, and of course that's been broken down ad nauseum now, and we're really not going to go into that, but we'll focus a little closer to home because, of course, on day three we find out that, guess what? A couple of Marshall players get picked up in the draft, and Justin Rohrwasser. By the way, he was on the program a couple weeks ago. You can go back and listen to that podcast. You want to get a kind of an idea of where he was at before the draft, but he became the first kicker in the draft this year when the Patriots took him in the fifth round. This is your special team's player of the year. This is a place kicker. Um, I mean, really... Place kicker won the award for the first time since 2005. That's a big deal. And he had the top field goal percentage in Conference USA at 857. 18 of 21 field goals. But you want a dependable kicker, you got one with the Patriots. And, of course, that Patriots connection to Marshall continues. There's no wonder why there are a lot of Marshall fans who also root for the Patriots. And, of course, I think part of that is just because Tom Brady and they win a lot. But other than that, there's that Marshall connection. So, Justin Rohrwasser goes, and I'm not really going to touch too much on this because I'm just, I I don't think it's a story, but I'm going to touch on it just briefly. The fact that some in the media were calling him out over his tattoos. They don't know the man. They don't understand who he is. They haven't uh, spent time with him, and... He addressed that in his comments to the media as far as what those tattoos were on his body, and it's going to be covered, and that's good enough for me. Some of his players' uh, teammates came out supporting him, basically said, look, that's uh, that's Bull. He's a good guy. Get off of it. You don't know what you're talking about. And I think that's where I'm going to leave it, really, because I don't think you can look at a person and just see – who they are based on one photo. I mean, yeah, he's got some tattoos, and yeah, I I look at his tattoos and go, all right, maybe not the artistic choice I would have made, but that's not me. And at the same time, if you talk to him and you get a a really good feeling for who he is and you know what you're getting, and I think the Patriots of all teams do their due diligence, and if they kind of had a feeling that this young man wasn't right, they wouldn't have taken him, but at the same time, You've got a young man who, of course, now, welcome to the NFL. Welcome to the National Football League. And let's be honest, as a media core, we're not exactly drilling these kids on a daily basis. I'm going to be quite candid and quite upfront with you. As a media core covering the Thundering Herd, uh, we're lobbing softballs on a daily basis. I don't think that we're really grilling Doc. We're not really grilling these kids we're not going after them and there's no need to there's no benefit there's no I'm trying to play gotcha with any of these guys like I'm trying to catch you up I'm trying to get you in a bad situation there's none of that you know basically you know we're covering the football team we're talking to the players and we're covering the game and not trying to play gotcha with anybody or really go after these kids it's like the graphics um, ESPN were using, highlighting some of the players and some of their personal stories. And wasn't necessarily a fan of where some of that went. But back to Rohrwasser, I mean, this young man is going to have a tremendous career, I hope, with the New England Patriots. And he addressed his tattoos. He looked at it. 
I mean, with the media, I mean, he talked about it and said, look, it's going to be covered. It's not what that's about. This is when I got it. That's not what it's about. It's going to be covered. And handle it well. And I think that's just ridiculous. I really didn't even think I was going to talk about that today, but I just kind of felt like I had to. But I think he's going to have a tremendous career. He's going to be a value for years to come if he can adjust to the NFL. But welcome to the NFL where, trust me, everybody's going to ask a question and they're all not going to be necessarily good because you've got media outlets that are going to be fair. You're going to going to have those media outlets that – they're just looking to do a story. They're looking to cover the game. They're looking to cover what happened in the game, maybe an interest piece on you. And then you've got other people who've got to you know, call out everything. And you've got people in between. you got some people who are looking for anything that they can get their hands on that's different. You've got other people who are truly trying to just cover the sport. Me, I'm not trying to play gotcha with anybody. i got other things to do. So... I think he's going to have a great career. And I'm not biased by the fact that I talked to him earlier this week and I've talked to him over the career. It's just it's just how I uh, perceive him as a good value for the Patriots and a good human being. Now, the other guy that got picked up, and I don't want to take anything away from him, is Chris Jackson, selected 243rd overall by the Titans. Seventh round, still taken. First Marshall player taken by the Titans. I mean, that's when they were the Houston Oilers, so we're going back a ways. So congratulations to Chris. Marshall now with that selection. And the draft has had multiple players taken in the same draft for the seventh time, first since 2003. It's been a while. So here you go. you got a couple of players taken. Doc loves special teams, so Justin Rohrwasser benefits from that. Chris Jackson. Pretty much a value pickup from the Tennessee Titans. Seventh-round pick. They're like, okay, look, he's probably the best DB on the board at this time. Let's go ahead and get him. Let's see what we can do with it. He he did finish as Marshall's all-time leader with 45 career pass breakups. I mean, that's ahead of Melvin Cunningham. Melvin Cunningham did it 41 times. Jackson's 52 passes defended, second only to Cunningham's 53, so very comparable to him statistically. First-team All-Conference USA. 25 tackles, 11 pass breakups, one interception. You know the deal. You know what good he's going to do back there. You know what he's capable of doing. So seventh round, that's great for him. And so he'll definitely, if he can stick, have a good career with the Tennessee Titans, and I really hope he does. And I thought Conference USA did pretty well as far as the draft was concerned. Of course, all the action was taking place on the third day. It's rapid fire stuff. It's really just rapid. And overall, I wasn't. Overly disappointed with the coverage the NFL draft had. Uh, I think that some people were off-put by the multiple talking heads. Yeah, this is what this was going to look like. It was going to look like a Zoom conference call. Why? Because you've got people in different locations. And you also are combining coverage this year. You had everything coordinated with the NFL Network and ESPN. So why did you have more people on screen? Because you were sharing coverage not trying to jungle up your screen. You're trying to share coverage. So how are we going to share coverage? Well, we're going to have these analysts here, and we're going to have these analysts here. And you can't have Trey Wingo and Rich Eisen. you got to have one quarterback or the other. So Eisen got sent over to a, a different platform. Trey Wingo, he's doing the draft this year. Best location he can do it from. Everybody else is trying to deal with it as well. This isn't the norm, but at the same time, I thought they did okay. Wasn't the best draft I've ever seen. Wasn't the worst draft I've ever seen. It it was what it was, a draft. And I think the NHL is looking into what the NFL did, kind of get a feel for how they put it together, what makes sense for them, what is good, what wasn't good. So you might have the NHL follow a similar format They're talking a little bit about the draft because we would be talking about the draft soon. Problem is, you really can't have a draft until you establish final regular season standings. And then, of course, you've got the playoffs and the hubs. The NHL is talking about still picking up some steam, some options there, trying to find places that have accommodations for multiple teams, practice facilities with multiple practice sheets of ice, of course, the arena, everything you need, multiple locker rooms. That's a big thing as well. You have multiple locker rooms. So 
if you are ever building a facility, a sports facility, you need multiple locker rooms. I don't care what it is. If you don't have multiple locker rooms, you're building it for one team, yours and the visiting team that comes in. I don't mean two locker rooms as multiple locker rooms. I'm talking three, four, multiple locker rooms here. So that way you can host events like this. I mean, that's a key. you got to have different locker rooms for everybody. So if you got multiple locker rooms, and, of course, a lot of arenas do. They're just built that way now. A lot of arenas don't. Some of them are more purpose-built. Some of them have multiple tenants. So you have – those situations you have to deal with on a daily basis uh, when you're trying to put together a, a sports league postseason. You're trying to figure out, okay, what's the best way we got to do this? Now, with all that said, I'm still interested to see what the NBA comes up with. I'm still interested to see what Major League Baseball comes up with because a lot of this is going to depend on how the states relax the restrictions, how the states are opening up. Some people think states are opening up too soon. A lot of people are in the middle. Some people are, hey, you're not opening up fast enough. You got some crazies who think you should be opening up last week. So we're all over the place here when it comes to when this should open up. And just to give you an example, Marshall has begun tentative plans, and these are tentative, tentative, tentative plans to have in-person classes for the fall 2020 semester. Now, Jerome Gilbert sent out a message to everyone on the campus or attached to the university today, sort of announcing the fact that, look, we don't know what's going to happen, but based on today's models, we're trying to figure out what the new normal looks like for the fall semester, emphasizing that everyone's going to know more in the coming weeks and months. And it's all going to come down to what's the infection rate look like how many cases are we dealing with in the region, the state? Also, will there be a spike, a second wave? All of this is going to play into this. And I'm, I'm sure that they're not going to open up the university unless it's absolutely safe. But at the same time, they're going to have to figure out, how do we do this? How do we do this and keep people safe? How do you space classes apart? How do you... Do you limit class load? Do you limit how many you can have in a classroom? I mean, what are going to be some of the challenges? Constant disinfection. I mean, it dis- you know, just basically disinfectant. It's going to be all over the place. You're going to have to. You're going to try to have to keep the facility as clean as possible because you're not just dealing with the COVID-19, the coronavirus. You're dealing with the flu and everything else. And so I'm sure we're going to find out what the plan is, how they're going to address this because – the thing that needs to be said is this thing's not going away. And so you're going to have to put measures in place to figure out how do we go about this and minimize the risk at the same time, not put our students in a situation where we are increasing the risk. Same thing with football, because you can't have football without students on campus. And a lot of this is driven by money. Let's be honest, a lot of this is driven by money to get this going again because there is concern that if you don't get this going soon, there's not going to be something to come back to. And I understand that completely. And that's where we're at right now. University trying to reopen because, well, let's be honest, this isn't for free. You're not Marshall's not giving out educations for free. I mean, there's a lot of money that goes into this. Pell Grants people out of pocket, everything. I mean, this this is for profit. Let's not be, you know, let's not get ourselves here. And so they've got to figure out how to do this, how to balance this. I guess that's the word, balance all of this with the reality that there's a virus out there without a vaccine right now. And you're trying to figure out how do you do this and still not get people sick. That's the ultimate Because I can't wait to see what the NFL does. How does the NFL go about? How do they handle? If they think they're going to be playing in the fall, how do they go about this? What has to happen for us to say, okay, we're playing football. And how many fans are going to show up? Is this going to be television only? And that's a better solution than nothing. You want to see football? Okay, it's going to have to be from home on television. You can't go. You watch it, 
but you can't go. And so that's going to be a different dynamic because, of course, concessions and everything else, there's going to be some lost revenue there. There's going to be people who are not going to capture that revenue from working those concessions and everything else and all the amenities, the luxury boxes, the ticket takers, the team shop. And this is just pro. This is pro, mind you. And on the college side, again, the answer is going to be, okay, how do you pull this off? Can you have college football without fans? And I don't know if you can. I mean, it's possible. It's technically possible. So let me just say, yeah, you you can have it, but can you? Can you play that without fans? Because the different revenue here, Marshall TV package with Conference USA, not paying the bills here. Tickets sold. Tickets sold. Again, tickets sold. People in the stands, people buying concessions, people buying merch, people paying for those parking spots so they can sit and tailgate and not go into the stadium and watch the game. That's that money that you have to capture, all part of this. And you're not going to capture that money if you don't have fans in the stands. And so we don't know. And Conference USA, still looking at what the realities are. Can you pull this off and have a situation where the schedule's going to change? I mean, Judy McLeod was talking to The Athletic. Let me pull that up here. I've got this story right here. Judy McLeod, she's talking to The Athletic and talking about, do you play more in your division? Do you play additional non-conference games with those around you since conference travel is pretty significant? And... She's saying, look, it might be a good idea to play your non-conference schedule a lot more regionally. Okay, that might be easier for, say, basketball. If I'm Marshall, okay, I can play, this is basketball. I can play Moorhead. I can play Ohio. That's easy. You can play Miami. You want to you wanna canvas Ohio? You got Akron? Yeah, you can play them. Sure, you can play them. Maybe you got to take a road trip. Maybe you're going down to Virginia Tech. You, they got an opening for you. All right. That's close enough. You can travel. You can make that trip. I mean, Eastern Kentucky, you can play them. I mean, you can play several schools in Kentucky. You could play several schools in Ohio. You could travel to Virginia for a couple of games. You've got some options here. You've got lots of options here as far as this regional scheduling is concerned. I mean, that's basketball. And that's probably the Olympic sports as well. You've got those options there. And travel is going to be an issue. We're going to talk a little bit more about that because travel is going to really be cut back, it looks like, depending on the situation. But North Texas is cutting some costs as well. They're trimming some expenses. We're going to talk about that. And, of course, I'll take your comments on Twitter. That's the best way to catch me during these trying times where we don't have a person answering the phone while I'm talking at the same time. So if you want to get a hold of me, the best way, if you're on social media, if you're on Twitter, go ahead, send me a message that way. I will try to respond to it as fast as I possibly can. And, of course, if you're listening to the show on delay, message me anyway. I'll take a, I'll take a look at it anytime I get that notification. We will come back and talk more on this Monday edition. It's The Drive on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. You're listening to The Drive with Paul Swan on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. We are presented by Huntington Federal Savings Bank. Welcome back to the Monday edition, The Drive on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. I'm your host, Paul Swan, and we were talking earlier in the last segment about budgets and travel and everything that's going to happen with college athletics. Let's just be quite honest with ourselves here. College athletics, no matter what happens, is going to change. And so scheduling is going to be a big change. That's going to be huge because you're going to see maybe games that cost a little bit more to travel to. Well, maybe that changes a little bit. And that could be more of a conference scheduling pattern. For Conference USA, that's going to have to change. No more far-flung trips to Texas if it can be avoided because that's just a burden on the universities. And Conference USA's geographical layout, not been a fan of this new revamped version. It was great once upon a time, and then it changed. And that conference is now called the American. 
with a couple of differences. So remember, if you don't, you remember the Conference USA landscape when Marshall was approached and Marshall was going to become a member? You got Louisville, you got Cincinnati, you have Marshall and the opportunity to play in this conference with Louisville and Cincinnati and these other schools and the geography, it just made sense and then it doesn't. Well, here is North Texas. North Texas, they've had to trim some expenses and they are trying to balance their budget. They've got $30 million budget. Their budget ends on August 31st and they've got a $2.3 million shortfall. And here's what they have asked their coaches to do. They have asked their coaches to eliminate non-conference games that would require flights. That's right, North Texas. North, the administration says, hey, look, coaches, if it requires a flight, we're going to have to ask you to eliminate that. They've also put a two-year moratorium on what they refer to as experience trips. Experience trips, okay. They are basically trying to figure out any and all things they can do as an administration, as a university, the university itself. The university, it's trying to find ways to cut back expenses, and they feel, at least in the athletic department, they in the athletic department, the, they feel that they're going to get this going. They're going to play. But they're also going to have to find ways to pay for a lot of their seniors to return. That's going to hit the budget because they're going to allow most of the athletes – that want another shot at their senior year to come back. Probably some of those athletes aren't coming back. They're going to move on. They've graduated or they're going to take other opportunities. You don't know what the future holds. So that's going to ease the burden a little bit. But we haven't heard what's going to happen yet from Marshall because we just don't know. We don't know what is going to happen. Will there be football? Will football impact the rest of the budget? Yes, it definitely will. But North Texas is already basically saying, look, if, if you got to take a flight, you're not going. No, North Texas is a different animal, though. North Texas, it's in Texas. And it kind of feels like if you're in Texas, everything you have to do takes a flight. But if you've got to travel to play and you've got to take a flight to do it, you're probably not going to be able to do that. Has it got to that point yet with other athletic departments? You know, Will you see Marshall come out eventually and say, look, okay, here's what the expense is, here's what the budget is, here's what we're going to do. We're going to cut flights. We're going to cut this. We're going to cut back on this. I mean, you really haven't heard anything out of Marshall the way some of these other schools are just all over the place. It's like North Texas has a press conference every week about some of this stuff, it feels like. Really, it it feels like North Texas. You can always depend on maybe North Texas. You can get something out of them. Old Dominion, you can always depend on something coming out of Old Dominion. You can almost put your finger on it and say, all right, one of these two are going to move soon. Which one will it be? And it's usually Old Dominion or North Texas. You get something out of them. And if North Texas is going to have to do this, what does that mean for the rest of the teams in Conference USA? What's that mean for for Marshall? And I don't know. And you don't know. And I don't know if the athletic department knows. And sometimes, and sometimes, not always, but sometimes, silence is better. It's just better sometimes to be silent. Because then you don't have anything that you can worry people with. Speculation is one thing, but that's what it is. That's all I'm doing. I'm speculating. I'm talking. I'm speculating. I am putting forth ideas, scenarios. I am putting forth what could happen, maybes, all of this. None 
of it could be true. The budget could be fine. The budget could be terrible. I don't know. And they're not going to tell me. They're not going to sit there and go, okay, you know what? We're on life support here, Paul. No, because we don't know what's going to happen yet. And I think that's a smart play in many regards because, let's be honest, if you're if you're in North Texas, I mean, you're trying to figure out, okay, how do we figure the budget shortfall out here? And you're like, sorry, coaches. I mean, I wouldn't want that stuff to get out. Again, if, if I'm thinking coach wise now, I'm thinking coach wise. I want to maintain. I want to keep all my cards as close to the vest as I possibly can. I want to keep everything I can close to the vest because the NCAA they denied the waiver, the blanket waiver that the group of five schools have requested for some relief. NCAA is like, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. You're you're all in it with us together. So in a sense, that's okay news for, say, if you're worried about a program getting cut, if you're worried about some of that. Or it's not good news if you're a university trying to figure out how do we do this without some relief. How do we do this without relief? And I think schedule adjustment is probably going to be the first thing you need to do. You need to make schedule adjustments. You need to rethink your schedule. You need to think how many trips do you make. If you're in Conference USA, you you should play geography. Honestly, you should play. If you're in Conference USA in basketball, you should play geography. Yeah, you got to take a money game, but it, does it work in the geography? Does it work in the footprint? You can't take the money game if it works in the geography. But if you're going elsewhere, if you're taking flights and – that's going to put a little strain on the budget. You got to think about it. I mean, one thing, if you take a flight down to Florida and your conference USA, you're going to play both Florida schools. I mean, you get two for one, basically. It's one thing, but if you're up and back somewhere, again, it's going to be a case-by-case, school-by-school issue. And I'm going to be quite honest with you. Again, not sure what's going to happen. Not sure if any of this is going to come to fruition. Not sure if I'm even on the dartboard right now. Because... I'm not in those meetings, and thankfully, I'm not wanting to be in those meetings. I don't want to have to figure this out. I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be Mike Hamrick right now. I mean, the hair's nice, but I don't want to be Mike Hamrick right now. We got more on the way. It's The Drive, ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Now, back to The Drive with Paul Swan on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. I am taking your phone calls. I just have to do it in the commercial break. 877-420-TALK, 877-420-8255. Mick is with us. Good hearing your voice again. What do you got for me, Mick? Mick, are you there? Hey, yes, sir. Paul, thank you for taking my call. And again, I apologize if you've already discussed this, but the, the current state of martial athletics then I'm wondering about the baseball field because uh, the completion date had already been moved back and the cost was much more than they first anticipated. Now with this mess that we have with everything else going on, how in the world does the Marshall baseball field fit in? And I will just uh, hang up and let you discuss that, all right? All right, that's a topic. Thank you, sir. That's Mick checking in. I appreciate that. That's a good question. Okay, again, this is without the advantage of asking that question directly to Mike Hamrick to this very moment. First of all, unless Marshall is quietly doing fundraising right now, Marshall, Mike Hamrick has gone on record. He said this, look, this isn't the time to go for fundraising. This isn't the time to call people up and say, hey, can you help us out? Because there are businesses right now that are depending on loans. There are businesses right now that – are trying to figure out how to stay open. There are a lot of people trying to figure out what their finances are. The economy is not in a good place right now. I mean, we're all struggling. Fair. So that's problem number one. Mike's not going to go out and just say, look, hey, I, I know you're struggling, but I need some money for the baseball park. So that's their first problem. Uh, second issue is I know a lot of the, the cost, a lot of it's got to do with getting the site ready you got to put some money into the site. With the city of Huntington's help, 
and the partnerships they've got, there could be some opportunities to maybe work on that site, get it down in cost, site per Yeah, the site needs worked on. So there's that issue. Um, I'm sure the plans will be revised. Instead of four bathrooms, maybe you get three bathrooms. Instead of four light poles, you might get three light poles. Instead of four concession stands, you might get three concession stands. I mean, there, there are ways to trim. There, there are ways to, to bring that in line. You want four bathrooms, get more money. You want three bathrooms, well, this is what you're going to deal with. I mean, there, there are ways to do this. They'll go back. They'll revise the, the blueprints. They'll revise the design. They will try to figure out what they need to do to get the bids in line a little bit more with what they have. But I don't see this as something we can say is going to happen until the state is back into whatever phase it's going to deem you can start construction again. And then Marshall's going to have to go out and figure out how to fundraise in this climate because Marshall's going to need to fundraise. Right? Fair? It's going to have to happen eventually. And so if you can get some added funds to this baseball park, maybe you can get everything you want, or maybe you're going to have to trim a couple of things from the design, trim a couple of amenities. I don't know. I mean, it's not as if they're going to build a grandstand with some wooden bleachers and call it a day. So I'm not worried about that. It's just there are so many moving parts right now, and I don't think it's fair to say that with Marshall and this COVID-19 situation that they're still pushing forward. Let's get this ballpark built. I think they're prioritizing what they're needing to do. I mean, where the baseball plans fit, I mean, yeah, you're going to have to hold back on this a little bit. You can't work on it until you can work. And so when the state is back to a point where you can have construction again, you can work again with whatever new guidelines and new restrictions you're going to have in place, then you can move forward. Is this thing going to be ready for next year? I don't think so. And that's fine. I'd rather it be ready when it's ready instead of trying to rush it forward because scheduling is going to change. Scheduling is completely changing right now. Whatever the landscape looks like, the football schedule, if Marshall and college football start on time, the schedule, I don't think it's going to be touched. If they got to push it back, then we're going to start juggling the schedule around. And with baseball, I think you're going to see some of the scheduling getting juggled around a little bit. I mean, that's going to have to happen. And you're going to see, I think, this eventual deadline to, okay, here, we're going to have to go. We can't just keep sitting on this here. We, we're going to have to build this thing and make it happen. But fundraising is going to be a challenge. I mean, honestly, fundraising is going to be tough because right now money's tight. I mean, a lot of people are risk adverse right now when it comes to their money. A lot of people are holding back. A lot of people are taking loans so they can keep their employers, I mean, their employees employed. They're trying to figure out ways to handle this. I mean, advertising. I mean, if you're a local business right now, are you spending local dollars to advertise? And if you've got the money, I think you should, for one. And that's not just me trying to sell you a commercial. That's me telling you, if you've got the what if you can advertise, you should because, again, if you're open for business, you should tell people you're open for business. I mean, keep that in mind. You should you should keep as best as you possibly can. You should tell people you're open for business. With that said, I'm not handling the marketing budgets for anybody. But if you have a marketing budget and you are open for business, you should tell people you're open for business. And I will gladly help you tell people that we're open for business. And that's just, of course, the, uh, the radio guy in me right now. But back to the point here, finances are going to be tough for everybody. I mean, the university is going to have to figure a way to streamline what they do from an educational standpoint and from an athletic standpoint. They're going to have to figure out how to do what they do with the potential of less revenue coming in. 
because I can't imagine 30,000-plus people being allowed in Jones C. Edwards Stadium to watch a Marshall football game. I can't imagine that. If it happens, I can't wait to see what the plan is to allow that to happen. Because if you're practicing social distancing, do you tell someone who has a chair back seat, okay, you have to sit six feet from where your seat is. And do you tell everybody who has a chair back seat, okay, we're going to spread you all out. And some of you might not be sitting in chair backs. How does this plan work? I don't know. I don't know if it does work. Or do you limit it to, okay, season tickets whole only. If you have bought a season ticket, you get to come in the stadium. And then we're going to spread you out. Does that make everybody happy? Does that work? No, I don't think that makes everybody happy. So I don't know what the plans are going to be. I don't think they know what the plans are going to be. And the challenge is to plan and then adjust as the days change. And nobody knows right now. And I think that's the honest answer. I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. There might be somebody uh, in the athletic department has a way better educational guess or idea of what's going on than I do because they have more information. I mean, the people who are in power know to some degree what – Plan A, B, C, D, E, F, and G look like, but I, I don't think we know from a day-to-day basis. Uh, good call, Mick. Appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Don't forget, uh, during commercial breaks, uh, we'll do this again tomorrow. That's the best time to actually get on the show, or you can find me on social media. We will come back and wrap it up. It's the Monday edition of The Drive here on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Buckle up. Paul Swan has the wheel on The Drive. ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. We are wrapping up today's edition of The Drive here on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. I'm your host, Paul Swan. Thanks for tuning in. I appreciate it. We'll be back tomorrow. We're going to try to do it all over again. I do believe scheduled to come on the program tomorrow. Don't hold me to this because schedules change, but I think we got uh, Ryan B. coming on the program tomorrow. So looking forward to getting back to uh, talking to uh, some guys who are past and present with the Marshall Thundering Herd. And uh, we're going to try to get Justin Rowerwasser on the program here in the near future. And we'll try to get a couple of the other guys that are uh, making their way through free agency as well. And I'm waiting a couple days before we start maybe making some phone calls just to see who ends up on a team only because we're still probably in that phase where guys are going to maybe get some invites I don't know how the NFL is going to do this, depending on what travel restrictions are or what facilities uh, they're going to be able to use. I don't know how this is going to work in the uh, post-draft because you kind of had an idea. But I will say this. um, you know, We'll try to get Omari Cobb on. We'll see if we can manage to get him on. He did sign with um, Kansas City um, as an undrafted free agent. So he is right now. He got a pretty good path if he can hang on to it to the NFL. But with Conference USA, I'll tell you this, uh, Conference USA did all right. For a group of five conference, the second best as far as numbers are concerned, that's not terrible. If uh, you see more Conference USA players taken in the draft, I I don't know what that's going to translate to, but I don't know. You need every advantage you can get. And Marshall getting two in the draft, it's not terrible. I mean, two's better than none. Two's better than one. But, hey, if uh, I'm looking for a kicker, I'm, I'm pointing at my guy Justin Rohrwasser and say, look, you see him? You, you want to be like him? That's going to do it for this edition. Thanks for tuning in. I appreciate it. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Stay safe, everybody. Wash your hands. All that good stuff. We'll reconvene in 23 hours. Until then, good night, everyone. WRBC Huntington, W227BS Huntington, your flagship home of the Marshall Thundering Herd and The Drive with Paul Swan, ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930.